Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome to this Dean's Research Seminar Series. Um, I'd like to uh, have a particularly warm welcome to uh, some of our students who are joining us today and I think this is a great opportunity for you to learn about what happens uh, across the Faculty of Veterinary and Agricultural um, Sciences in one of our particular research areas. Um, these seminars are designed to provide people with an overview of a particular topic of research and are not going to be in-depth specialist uh, research seminars with lots and lots of um, data slides. Um, but you may have to uh, you may have to bear with it in certain points when um, it comes to some sort of uh, specialist science. But I'm sure you'll get the ideas about what people do and the importance of their research. Today we've got uh, Professor Rebecca Traub, and I'll say a few words about Rebecca. She graduated from Murdoch University with a bachelor's degree in veterinary medicine and surgery. And then she worked in a small animal practice in Perth until about 2002. In 2000, she started on her PhD, which was on canine gastrointestinal parasitic zoonoses in the tea growing communities in Assam, India. And she was awarded the John Frederick Adrian Sprent Prize by the Australian Society for Parasitology for her work in that. In 2004, she was the recipient of a three year ARC industry postdoctoral fellowship. And this allowed her to extend her research on canine parasitic zoonoses in Thailand. In 2006, uh, she started as a lecturer in veterinary public health at the School of Veterinary Science at the University of Queensland and widened her research interests into the development and application of molecular epidemiological and diagnostic tools to look at public health risks um, by foodborne and vector-borne parasitic zoonoses, that is parasites that go from animals to humans. Professor Traub has published over 130 peer-reviewed uh, papers. She's been cited over 5,000 times. Um, she's um, written book chapters and um, she's been uh, sought out by various international organizations, including the Gates Foundation, the World Health Organization, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the veterinary pharmaceutical industry um, to provide them with advice. She's a professor in Melbourne Veterinary School, and in 2019, Rebecca was the recipient of the Bancroft Macarius Medal from the Australian Society for Parasitology in recognition of her outstanding contributions to the field of parasitology. Rebecca, are you all set to go? Yes, thank you very much for the introduction, John. You're, you're on then. Okay, and thank you for the invitation to um, present today, John. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for taking uh, this lunchtime out to have a listen to some of the research that we do here in the Melbourne Veterinary School. Um, I'm going to be talking particularly about uh, a parasite that um, is, is not only common in, in humans in developing countries, but also dogs, and uh, a little bit about my research that spans uh, since the days of my PhD. Uh, thesis uh, till now and um, how basically we, we need to apply a One Health approach for the prevention of um, these worm infections, especially in developing countries, um, for the prevention of, how do, how, of uh, hookworm infections in humans through uh, also treatment of dogs. So going forward, uh, so what are human soil transmitted helminths? So as you can see from the images, these are roundworms, okay? So they range in size from half a foot long to one, millimeter, uh, to one centimeter long. Um, they are a diverse um, group of, of what we call uh, parasites that, or, or nematodes that live in the small intestine and whipworms live in the colon. And they have quite serious effects on human health, as, as you can imagine. They are part of a group of communicable diseases that the World Health Organization um, refer to as the neglected tropical diseases. So these are a diverse group of uh, infectious diseases that affect the poorest of the poor, uh, communities that uh, lack adequate sanitation and hygiene, and those that live in quite close contact with infectious vectors like mosquitoes and also domestic animals that have very little access to veterinary care. Um, of those neglected tropical diseases, many are actually uh, classified as ne neglected zoonoses. So those are actually neglected diseases 
in the tropics that are transmitted between animals and humans. Um, but funnily enough, the soil transmitted helminths in humans are not considered zoonotic. They are considered to be transmitted primarily by humans to other humans, at least by the World Health Organization. So these soil transmitted helminths, so roundworms, hookworms and whipworms, are known to infect 1.5 billion people um, across the world. And as you can see by the distribution of these parasites, mainly in tropical and subtropical areas, and mainly distributed in countries with very low GDPs per capita. Of the soil transmitted helminths, I would like to concentrate today on the hookworms. Um, you will see from these electron microscopic images that uh, they are indeed almost alien or monster looking. And um, if, if the one on the left is, is Nicato americanus, it's um, the American hookworm, although it doesn't just occur in Americas, it occurs globally across the tropics. It's the most common hookworm of humans. And you will see from its mouth that it has what we call cutting plates. And these cutting plates, um, just like the one on the right, which has cutting plates inside, but you will also see teeth, right? Like a Dracula kind of teeth with Ancelostoma duodenali, also a human hookworm. So these guys basically inflict um, disease by living in the small intestine. And these cutting plates actually cut into the mucosa of the small intestine, so into the wall of the small intestine, and by a serrating mechanism, um, and also through um, the excretion of enzymes, uh, digest away that mucosa and in turn cause or, or absorb or eat. These hookworms actually then ingest blood from the host, and it's not only that they ingest blood from the host, but these critters basically, after they've had a meal, decide after an hour or so, oh, I'm going to now leave this site and go to a fresh site. And so they attach, suck the blood, uh, detach, go to another site, and keep doing this repetitively. The problem is that the site that they detached from previously continues to bleed. And so you can imagine the effects on the host. So the effect primarily lies in its ability to cause blood and protein loss um, from the gut. So hookworms, um, it is estimated, infect half a billion people. Most of the impact is on childbearing, uh, women of childbearing age and children. So Especially in, especially in these two cohorts, the, um, uh, the effect of these worms um, results in what we call anemia and malnutrition due, due to protein loss. This in turn um, affects a child's ability to learn. So the child is in many cases stunted. Um, they have uh, reduced intellectual uh, capabilities and reduced cognitive function. Um, the anemia is an iron deficiency anemia because a lot of the iron stores are lost through blood loss. And this, as you realize, even in pregnant women, iron is a major, um, uh, how do you say, is, is a major nutrient. So we, um, here in Australia, we still take iron and folate uh, tablets while pregnant. So these um, communities don't have a very high um, standard of, of or a very high capability of, of you know, eating nu nutrient-rich or iron-rich foods. And then this is exacerbated by the fact that they also have hookworm. So this can result in high uh, maternal mortality and morbidity. So, um, and also affect, uh, for example, uh, the, innate, the um, birth weight of, of, of uh, neonates. So low birth weight is also a consequence um, of hookworm infection. So really is quite, um, uh, how do you say, disastrous as far as population health. So as a result of, of the impact of soil transmitted helminths, uh, the World Health Organization in uh, 2012 
um, basically came up with a roadmap and that roadmap was to eliminate the morbidity associated with soil transmitted development infections uh, by 2020, which is this year. And I was just listening to a, a WHO seminar the other day on how COVID has impacted this. Um, and it's, uh, yes, it's gone, you know, we haven't quite reached those goals, but um, I'm very glad to hear that uh, I think the roadmap to 30 to 2030 um, does uh, sound very promising in that it, it is going to adopt a lot of the um, control interventions that I'm going to be discussing today. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not over. We still have uh, soil transmitted helminth infections, especially in women and children, but uh, they haven't given up. And I think the road uh, looks promising for the next 10 years. So basically what they intended to do and continue to continue to do is treat at least 75% of the children and women at most risk in endemic areas. And in 2018, uh, a whopping like over half a million children uh, were dewormed. But again, given the, the increasing uh, population, this only represented 53% of all at-risk children. So they didn't quite reach the mark, but we, how do you say, we continue to persevere. So how is hookworm transmitted? Well, like I mentioned before, hookworms, the males and females, they live in the small intestine and they reproduce and produce these eggs that are passed in the, fe in the feces of humans. And in these communities where toilets are not uh, either available or utilized, uh, a lot of these, a lot of the uh, people might defecate outside in the field. And so these eggs, uh, especially in the beautiful tropics, it's ideal conditions for them, they develop uh, or embryonate and hatch. And the larvae that hatch uh, from the eggs enter the soil and um, then molt. So they evolve to become infective. And then they remain in the soil for about three months. And in that period, they wait for a human host to come along um, and as soon as they do, they sort of wiggle up and very quickly penetrate the skin, most commonly the soles of the feet. And using enzymes, um, they, they get into the soles of the feet and into the dermis and enter the circulation. So once they enter the blood circulation, they then migrate through the liver, the lungs, and as they do, they get bigger, they mature. Uh, eventually they coughed up and swallowed back into the gastrointestinal tract. So quite a complicated route, uh, but it works. Uh, so they end up back in the small intestine again as males, adult males and females and reproduce. So this at least is the classical life cycle or transmission cycle of hookworms um, that has been published in books and in, um, on websites. So this is the website of the Centers for Disease Control in the US. And as you can see, they to, um, you know, accept the fact that this is a human transmitted disease. So it's human to human and the main species uh, are Ancelostoma duodenale and Nicada americanus, which are the two primary human hookworms. The World Health Organization till today, so this was published in March 2020, still again believe that the soil transmitted helminths are uh, transmitted by eggs and they should say larvae that are present in human feces which uh, contaminate soil and, and then are passed on by percutaneous and in some cases oral transmission and that the main species that infect people, at least with the hookworms, are Nicata americanus and Antelostoma duodenale. So you guys must be wondering. 
why these parasites and why are dogs uh, important in preventing these infections in humans? And so the story begins. So I can't get any response because I obviously have uh, a screen in front of me, but these are the various communities that we've worked in over the past uh, couple of decades now. Um, so ranging from Assam on the left to Thailand in the middle and more, more recently Cambodia. And if, if you have a look, you can quite easily spot the commonality between all these communities in, the, in Asia. And that is of course the role of dogs. So in these communities, there is a very, very strong human canine bond. Um, there are uncontrolled populations of semi-domesticated dogs uh, that completely lack veterinary attention. And these little dogs, um, in this case, very little, um, share close relationships with humans and especially kids. Um, the benefits are the same as, as us in, in developed countries. Uh, with regards to companionship, uh, companionship um, and protection, not only personal protection, but also protection uh, for livestock from predators like jackals, for example, in India, that, that was the case. Um, of course, there are risks. So the biggest risk is uh, kids being bitten um, by, by dogs and of course, the most um, famous and, and of course, the most significant of these zoonoses are rabies. So in a lot of communities we've worked in, rabies vaccination for dogs has been completely non-existent. So a lot of times when we do go into communities to actually sample, we also uh, perform rabies vaccinations and microchipping on these dogs. Um, I think the, basically if you can catch a dog, you might as well vaccinate it. I mean, that's, that's just the basics. Um, the risks, apart from rabies, are the plethora of zoonotic diseases that may be transmitted from dogs to humans. Um, this is exacerbated, of course, by the tropics. The climate is just absolutely conducive for, uh, uh, for you know, the growth, not only of parasites, but other bacterial uh, diseases and also vector-borne diseases. The poor uh, environmental hygiene and sanitation, as I said, complete lack of veterinary services, and also on behalf of the people and children especially, a really poor knowledge on, on, on zoonoses and how these can be prevented. So in a nutshell, I could probably quite easily um, do five to 10 seminars just on canine parasitic zoonoses, but dogs, um, can transmit parasites to human in various ways. So these, as I mentioned before, could be via a vector. So this could be, for example, uh, lymphatic filariasis caused by brugia um, or tick-borne encephalitis uh, caused by a, a virus that can transmit to humans via the bite of mosquitoes and ticks and then flea-borne spotted fever here. Even in Australia, we have this. Uh, transmitted to humans via fleas. Um, so vector-borne is one uh, way. Direct contact, so the most common uh, disease we think of with the direct contact, uh, which is parasitic in nature, is, is scabies. So scabies is a temporary zoonosis. It's, it's not a permanent one, but um, uh, if, if a dog has sarcoptic mange, it is possible that it can transmit it to humans. Um, and even if the human is not the normal host for scabies, um, continuous uh, exposure to scabies mites from dogs may cause chronic infections in humans. Similarly, giardia can also potentially be transmitted from dogs to humans, as can other protozoa. Uh, the one I'm going to be really talking to you about today with the hookworms are an environmental source of uh, zoonosis. So in this case, the roundworms and whipworm, or the roundworms and hookworms transmitted by dogs do not infect humans directly, but through the environment, because these soil transmitted helminths do require an essential period in the environment to become infective, and then they are infective to humans. So these are basically environmental sources uh, with dogs as reservoirs. 
And then finally, dogs can also be reservoirs for worms that um, can infect humans through ingestion of uh, things like fish or different foods. Um, and these are very common in Southeast Asia. So examples of this are the liver flukes and another nematode called nathostoma that migrates under our skin. Um, so it's, it's, again, dogs are a major source of parasitic zoonoses for humans, um, especially in these developing communities. So coming back to canine hookworms. So human hookworms do cause a lot of morbidity. But in addition to Ancelostoma duodenali and Nicato americanus, canine hookworms may also infect humans. So canines, there are three main canine hookworms in the tropics, Ancelostoma caninum, Ancelostoma brasiliensi, and the third one is Ancelostoma solanicum. So the, all three canine hookworms, as well as human hookworms, um, can cause this um, pruritic rash to develop, uh, most commonly in, on the soles of the feet, but also known as plumber's rash and here in, in, um, in developed nations, because when we have, when, in the old days when hookworm was common here in, in dogs and cats, um, it was most commonly the plumbers who, who got infected around their uh, back and upper, uh, should I say, bottom area. Um, by working upside down under houses. So any part of the skin that's in contact with soil, um, if hookworms uh, penetrate that skin, you will get this papular rash, very itchy, but it'll go away. So in a couple of days, it's gone. So it's a hypersensitivity or allergic reaction caused by the migrating larvae of hookworm in the upper dermis. And when this hookworm is an animal hookworm, it's referred to as cutaneous larva migrans. There is one hookworm called Ancelostoma brasiliensi, and it is this hookworm that's present pretty much all around the tropics, so plus or minus 20 degrees um, uh, north and south of the tropics. And this uh, hookworm causes this awful lesion uh, called creeping eruptions. So in this case, the rash doesn't disappear in a couple of days. Um, these hookworm larvae continue to migrate through the skin or the dermis and with it produce quite a severe allergic reaction that follows the path of that larvae. And that's why you get these amazing looking um, sort of serpent-like uh, welts um, on the areas that they have penetrated. And this condition will last for weeks and may become infected and will require treatment. The good thing with Ancelostoma brasiliensi, it does not go beyond the dermis, it does not enter the circulation. So it is only limiting to cutaneous larva migraines. Ancelostoma caninum, it is the most common hookworm of dogs, at least um, uh, throughout the world. Um, it also can infect humans. In fact, uh, Australia, um, Paul Prosev and Alex Lucas were um, the first to discover that uh, the dog hookworm uh, could in fact end up as adults in the small intestine of humans. And this discovery was made in, in Brisbane, in Queensland actually, where in all these cases they found that it was very commonly a single non-patent worm. What we mean by non-patent was because it was just a single worm, and these worms were not always adults, they couldn't reproduce. Um, so it was an abnormal infection of a human with a dog hookworm. Majority of humans were asymptomatic, didn't even know they were infected, but in some cases, these humans did suffer from uh, abdominal pain, diarrhea, a bleeding into the feces, and peripheral eosinophilia. So the eosinophil counts, or the cells that uh, react to allergens, so ones that go up during allergies, uh, were very high. But it was a very, it was a challenge to, I guess, diagnose for doctors because there were no parasite eggs and feces, and they were very often uh, these um, cases were discovered in humans only upon uh, 
examination using a pill cam or a, a, colon, um, or a colonoscopy. Uh, the good news now is we know that it um, resolves very quickly with anthelmintic. So if you are in Queensland and uh, you are diagnosed with eosinophilic enteritis, so eosinophilic in inflammation of the gut, the first thing the gastroenterologist will do is treat you for a full for worms. And um, if that resolves, the good news is you don't have to undergo a colonoscopy. Um, so that's good. But yes, Ancelostoma caninum is um, also a zoonosis. In the majority of cases, um, it's, it's uh, asymptomatic and it's quite rare that we actually find cases in humans. So going back to the year 2000, um, I decided to do my PhD in tea growing communities in Assam in India. And that's uh, close to my heart because I grew up in India. And um, so I basically looked at parasites of both humans and animals in these communities. And I wanted to just explore um, what was happening as far as exchange of parasites between humans and, and uh, dogs in this community. So the first thing I did was collect um, samples from dogs and did uh, microscopic examination. And unsurprisingly, we found that hookworm was the most common parasite of dogs. So almost all dogs were infected with hookworm. Similarly in humans, we found hookworm was the most common parasite infecting humans in these um, pea growing communities in Assam. And you will see quite interestingly, if you look at the, at the um, figure, the highest intensity of infection, so intensity, Uh, is in fact to suffer from clinical signs such as anemia. And that always occurs in hookworms in the early adolescence uh, or uh, early adult age. So 16 to 20 is when that peaks. And that is related to uh, increased exposure. So this is very likely when um, people start working out in the fields and therefore um, are exposed to higher numbers of larvae in the soil. Um, also, the thing to note with hookworm is there is no absolute immunity. So with other parasites and even viruses and bacteria, there are vaccines available. So, you know, as you get older, the chances of you getting infected or being infected heavily by, by a pathogen uh, becomes less. Not so with hookworm. The uh, immunity is, is not very strong. At that point in time, all I had available to me as far as diagnostics was a microscope. So we would collect feces from dogs and humans, we'd look under the microscope, and if we found hookworm eggs, we'd say they were infected with hookworm. However, at that point in time, PCR, so a polyramase chain reaction, um, was becoming more popular. In fact, Robin Gasser was one of the first to develop a, a conventional PCR to diagnose hookworms in, in fecal samples. And so I almost went with that idea and said, well, I'd like to know exactly what these hookworm eggs represent. Because in dogs, they could represent three different species in the tropics. If it was the subtropics and temperate area, it could be four different species. And in humans, as we've been told, it could be two different species, Nicator and Ancelostoma duodenali. So as a result of this, my, one of the first things I did for my PhD is develop a species specific um, PCR to identify Ancelostoma or hookworm eggs directly from eggs and the feces. And lo and behold, came across uh, the fact that and Solostoma solanicum was the predominant hookworm of dogs, at least in Assam, in this northern northeast region of India. I have to admit, I had never heard of Ancelostoma solanicum prior to my PhD. I was never taught about it as a veterinary student or a, an undergrad, or even as a vet. Uh, it was a complete unknown to me. So I decided to look more into this 
bookworm. Going back to the literature, I came across one of the earliest reports of this um, hookworm uh, was in 1911 by Lewis, and he had discovered a new ancylostom, um, ancylostome or ancylostoma from a civet cat in Sri Lanka, and he named it Ancylostoma silanicum. Two years later, Major Clayton Lane, ironically from uh, a human and uh, discovered the same parasite from a human in Calcutta. Uh, ironically, that's the place I was brought up. And, um, and he said, this is a new species of hookworm that present in humans. So this was all extremely new and exciting to me as a PhD student. Kept looking at the literature and we go forward 10 years during the global hookworm campaign that was basically funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. And um, during this campaign, they did uh, large amounts of deworming. And when they dewormed humans, they would actually painstakingly um, individually, uh, morphologically identify all the worms, and there could be thousands of them in some cases, that were individually purged out into the feces, or they would if people had passed away, they would uh, perform uh, autopsies to actually identify the different hookworm species present in these humans. I mean, this is painstaking work to do it uh, in, in that conventional but gold standard uh, fashion. And again, what did they find? They found that in Malaysia, for example, Ancelostoma solanicum was present. It infected less than 5% of individuals. And it was mostly present in mixed infections with the human hookworms, as they say, Nicado and Duodenali, and Slostoma duodenali, that predominated. They also found, so this is, for example, something they found in Fiji, is that of those infected, most people harbored uh, light, non-egg producing, single sex infections with Ancelostoma solanicum. Ignore, it says uh, Ancelostoma brasiliensi. The two were confused in the old days until the 1950s that when they found it to be two separate species. So that paper actually means Ancelostoma solanicum. And basically it was, you know, an abnormal um, one-off finding of zero significance at this stage. Further studies um, done between uh, the 19, early 1900s and right up till 1972 found something very similar. Uh, similar. So of all the hookworms in, uh, the, um, in the Southeast Asia and India, uh, Ancelostoma solanicum basically represented a very, very low percent of total hookworm burden. And as a result was classified as a rare and imperfectly adapted parasite of humans, usually associated with light and mostly single sex, non-patent or non-egg producing infections. And Chowdhury and especially Jerry Shad, Jerry Shad is the hookworm guru. Um, and so chapter closed and chucked away. But I didn't quite, want to believe that, I guess, as a PhD student. Um, and so when I did have an opportunity to look further at hookworms uh, during my postdoctoral fellowship, um, I developed quite a specific copper diagnostic uh, PCR again to look at the human hookworm species now, including Ancelostoma solanicum as uh, a target. And what we found in this community was that in dogs, again, Ancelostoma solanicum was the predominant hookworm species. And in humans, unfortunately, these temple communities of Bangkok didn't really have much uh, hookworm present, but I was surprised to find that of the hookworms present, um, a, a few humans, so I think it was four out of seven, had Ancelostoma solanicum. As, Patent infections. So these were egg producing infections. 
Further um, studies that we did in collaboration with um, Yvonne Lim from the University of Malaya, um, again, struck Ancelostoma solanicum as the predominant hookworm among dogs and cats, uh, also in, in uh, orang asli communities in Malaysia. And um, in this case, I think it was 24% of human hookworms were found to belong to Ancelostoma solanicum. Uh, we genetically characterized, um, so we looked at the, compared the DNA of, of uh, this hookworm from dogs and humans uh, on, on a variable gene, and we found that they were in fact related. So what this means is genetically humans and animals, or humans, dogs and cats, were sharing the same uh, families of hookworms. So they were passing it among themselves or between different hosts. We are not immune, <laughs> so um, we also, uh, a student uh, of, of Andy Thompson's and mine back in uh, 2007, also discovered Ancelostoma solanicum to be present in dogs in Australia. So representing 10% of human, of um, hookworm infections with dogs, in dogs. So um, of, of canine infections, 10% were Ancelostoma solanicum. So yes, it is present here in Australia. And then the next project was a PhD student of mine called Tevin Impunku, who is now a lecturer in Kazisat University in Bangkok. And as part of his PhD, he went to Cambodia. And this was just an incredible shock. 60%, approximately 60% of humans were positive for hookworm infection overall using microscopy. When we subjected those human fecal samples to PCR, we found that half of those, so 25 to 30% of these humans, had Ancelostoma solanicum infections, and this is egg producing infections. So sufficient worms of both sexes to produce eggs. And this, I think, was an absolute groundbreaking study that just changed and flipped everything on its head. So what we found was the infection dynamics. So this is how these canine hookworms or Ancelostoma solanicum infects humans was basically mimicking that of Nicada americanus. So it mirrored the human hookworm. It was almost like a human hookworm. In dogs, it did something similar, which was not surprising, but what I'd like you to actually look at is the mean in egg intensity of eggs per gram feces. So how many eggs are passed, or the or intensity of eggs passed in feces was 10 times higher in dogs than in humans. So what this is telling me is that dogs are the primary reservoir for this hookworm in, for humans. So that was published in Emerging Infectious Disease, as I said, that really was a game changer. And following on from that, we also found Ancelostoma solanicum in the Solomon Islands in quite high numbers in humans. And um, as a result of the culmination of those findings in the last um, 10 years, I did write a re review um, saying that this was now officially a re-emerging but neglected parasitic zoonoses. And at last, there was some recognition of this apparently new, or should I say re-emerged hookworm. And other groups had started looking for it and lo and behold, found it in different communities uh, in, in Asia and the Asia Pacific. So recently I had a, another review um, updating the, um, the situation of Solanicum um, published, so it's still in press. But this is a, a, basically a, a figure that uh, Katerina did, uh, taken out of that publication. And you can see that prior to um, my review in 2013, the orange 
uh, represents the studies that had been done where they had found Solanicum in humans from the time of discovery to that date in 2013. And the humans in purple represent the report of Solanicum after the 2013 review. So I am very happy that people, apart from us, our group, are now looking into this emerging zoonoses. And as you can see, wherever the parasite is present in dogs, inevitably it's present in humans. And these are the kind of numbers we're seeing. So anywhere between 6% of, of hookworm infections to up to 50 in Cambodia. And recently, I haven't put it up there, but we um, did a, a survey in Solomon Islands um, last year, together with uh, Susanna Neary and Andrew Steer from, um, from uh, Kirby Institute and Murdoch Children's um, Research Institute. And in some villages, Solanicum was up to 40% overall prevalence. So this is just mind blowing. So what does it all mean? The clinical significance? Yes, it is clinically significant. We, we know that um, uh, Dutch Marines returning from Papua in the 1960s um, were uh, found to be anemic, even with as few as 100 worms present in their gut. A uh, few of them, a third of them actually had single infections. So uh, this, this is definitely a human parasite and capable of causing anemia even in healthy individuals. Some more recent data showing some case studies that have been reported now in the literature, um, showing that uh, both indigenous um, uh, or autochthonous cases have been found in various parts of Asia as well as in return travelers. Um, and in many cases, clinical signs uh, ranging from abdominal pain, watery diarrhea, sometimes with blood, and even fever and uh, breathing difficulty uh, does accompany infection. And what's most striking is the very high levels of eosinophils in these humans. So the body is reacting in a very serious fashion um, to this um, almost invader that it's not really used to. So it's, it's um, the allergy cells are going up the roof. In some cases, not all, um, anemia was also um, recorded in these humans. So the question, and I'm going to leave at this, is what is the re reason for the emergence of Solanicum over the last half a century? So as I've said, basically the World Health Organization with various governments basically are implementing a mass drug administration program to try and alleviate uh, clinical signs associated with helminth infections worldwide, so in the tropics. And what they aim to do is break transmission so that uh, they don't need to keep uh, deworming humans forever but lower it to a level where transmission cannot be sustained anymore. So if they continue doing this without treating dogs, this is what might happen. The ratio of Antelostoma solanicum and even caninum and Brazilianzi um, to the human hookworm larvae in the environment or in the soil are going to go up um, as the human hookworm contamination reduces. Um, so what I see is happening if we do not include dog health programs in human de as part of the human deworming program, um, we might actually exacerbate these abnormal, so-called abnormal infections in humans. So the other question is, human hookworms have been there for 100,000 years. So they've lived and they've adapted to humans. Um, and my question also is, if humans lack an absolute protective immunity, um, so basically if a human is infected with hookworm, they then are, they have a stronger immunity towards being reinfected with newly entering hookworm larvae. But if you get rid of what's natural in a human, 
in a way. So this is quite controversial. If you get rid of the natural human hookworm, does that open up the, the gut to now accept abnormal or unnatural canine hookworms more easily or more readily? And the other question is, for example, are the drugs we're using against humans perhaps not working as well against the dog hookworm as they do with human hookworms? And we did test for this. So we did look at um, humans and Cambodia. We um, tested them for different hookworm species prior to and after treating them uh, with uh, an anthelmintic drug called albendazole. And what we found was this is not the case because we used qPCR, so quantitative PCR, to actually measure uh, the uh, difference in the, or the reduction in eggs of the, um, the individual species of hookworm pre and post treatment. And we found that by Ancelostoma solanicum, um, it was highly effective. So it was definitely not um, the fact that these Ancelostoma solanicum hookworms don't respond to the drugs that we are now administering humans. So this is something that Major Clayton Lane um, stated in his first, uh, I guess, report of Ancelostomus solanicum in a human in Calcutta. He said that if solanicum is at all a serious factor in human ancelostomiasis, then the problem of prevention will entail not merely the freeing of man from this parasite, but it goes on to stay, but also the similar treatment of healthy dogs will be recommended or, or, or absolutely ne 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 a necessity. So this was June 1913, and Major Clayton Lane had already discussed or brought up the concept of what we now call One Health. So it's nothing new, it's just a recognition of it um, by the authorities today that we need to work in, in a multidisciplinary approach. We need to have intersectorial collaboration to tackle these neglected tropical diseases and emerging zoonoses, so of course, uh, COVID being one of them. I would like one day the World Health Organization to actually change what they write on their website and say that the soil transmitted elements um, are present not only in human but also animal feces, and that um, it would be nice also for them to acknowledge Ancelostomus solanicum as the third human hookworm. I'm very happy to say that the Census for Disease Control now have included Solanicum on their website. So thank you, Richard, if you are watching, um, as well as um, their, I guess, um, description of causal agents of human hookworm disease. Just finishing off, I'd like to just mention the brief uh, briefly, the um, projects that we're currently conducting uh, in my group. So Dr. Vito Colella is a McKenzie postdoctoral fellow, and uh, Vito is looking at um, a randomized control trial in uh, uh, villages in Cambodia. So he's looking at 12 different villages and measuring the impact of six monthly deworming of dogs on the prevalence and burden of zoonotic hookworms and threadworms in school children. And this is above and beyond that of the normal treatment they get from their um, teachers through the Ministry of Health. Um, so how will deworming dogs impact over and above that of school-based deworming on reducing uh, hookworm and threadworm infection in children? Cam's doing something similar in East Arnhem Land and in Northern Queensland, he's looking at the effectiveness and feasibility of dog deworming programs for the control of, again, hookworm, zoonotic hookworm and strongoloides in indigenous communities. Patsy's, um, as well as helping us a lot in the field, is going deeper and looking at the population genetics of Ancelostoma solanicum and strongoloides between humans and dogs in various um, uh, spots in the Asia Pacific. And she's gonna be using a deep sequencing DNA based approach for this. Whoops. Luca um, 
is doing something similar here in Australia, but concentrating more on dogs. And uh, uh, he has just published again, it's in press, uh, a very nice new high throughput multiplex qPCR for the surveillance of zoonotic species of canine hookworms that far passes, surpasses the one that I developed during my PhD many years ago. So it's a nice new tool that um, we've already started to uh, translate to different uh, communities in, in um, uh, Nigeria and in Kiribati. And yes, Silanicum is present in Kiribati as well. Um, and Ushani, we don't just stick to helminths, there are also vector-borne diseases of dogs that may infect humans. So she's also looking at a survey of vector-borne diseases, not only in dogs in Australia, but also in her home country, Sri Lanka. Lucas is doing something similar in Cambodia with vector-borne diseases using a uh, very novel uh, next generation uh, metabarcoding meta based diagnostics. And so is Cassandra. So she's looking at the role of reservoirs, as role of dogs as reservoirs or sentinels of human vector borne diseases in Mongolia. And again, using conventional and next generation based barcoding diagnostics. So a lot of my students are tackling the whole issue of dogs and, and zoonotic um, infectious uh, diseases, especially or trying to see whether there are emerging ones that we might have missed. And I'm really, really proud of them. So with that, I'd just like to say thank you to, um, uh, I guess, our funders, not direct, but I can say that uh, a lot of times we've had to use funding to pad the research that I've mentioned because it's very difficult to get um, funding for One Health based research um, from any institute at the moment, uh, but also a huge shout out to all my collaborators um, since my PhD days. So thank you. Um, Rebecca, we've lost you, at least I have on my screen. It's difficult to tell whether that's my screen or that's, um, that's you, but thank you so much for that seminar. Um, can I invite every everybody uh, to, that would like to ask a question for Rebecca. Um, could I ask you to type it into the question and answer and we'll, uh, we'll do it that way. And I see there's already a few questions. Um, but maybe while you're thinking about your questions, I could, uh, I could ask a first question. Rebecca, um, I'm a virologist and if I saw a disease uh, increasing in incidence in the, in the way that you've seen that in prevalence, um, I would sort of think maybe my virus has changed in some way. And um, so do parasites change that much? Obviously they've got much larger, much more complex genomes. I mean, do you have uh, genomes from um, that uh, Salonicum that goes back maybe 50 years or 80 years or something and you can compare it with what's around today? It's a good question, but um, yeah, I, I don't think parasites- I hear you in my, in my system. Can you... I'm muting and unmuting your microphone. No? I can hear Rebecca, John. No. Nope. No? Might be yours, John. You can hear? Yeah, I, can yeah. hear. I think so, yeah. It's probably my system. But, yeah, I don't think parasites are exciting as uh, viruses in, in uh, at least um, uh, the way they mutate, John. Um, they, they mutate at a very, very slow rate. So we're looking at uh, probably hundreds uh, to maybe thousands of years before they adapt to new hosts. Um, at this stage, I would love to believe that, um, you know, it's as simple as, as a genetic mutation that's caused Solanicum to adapt uh, to a new host uh, and that we are now, you know, observing this process in history. There is a possibility we could go back. I know at least of one researcher in Nottingham that has worms from Jerry Shad's day, um, and we could compare it maybe to the whole genome sequence of uh, Silanicum that we've got today, but I'm not sure if it would be, yeah, very rewarding. I, I do think that it's most likely associated with, um, as I was saying before, the ratio of um, dog to human hookworms in the soil and a matter of probability of a human encountering a dog hookworm prior to 
it encountering the human hookworm and basically getting infected with that, you know, in the first instance. Okay, all right, thank you for that. Um, there are some questions um, online, and uh, why don't we go to Abdul Ghaffar Kamar? I'm not sure whether I pronounced that correctly. Um, Abdul, do you want to ask your question? Uh, we should be able to open your microphone. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. John, and uh, I'm also thankful to Rebecca Trapp for arranging such a great session uh, Thanks, online for international students. And, and I'm happy to uh, tell John that I have worked with Rebecca Trapp during my master's studies, that I have sent samples from dogs to her for the screening. So my question to the Rebecca that we have uh, learned that to stop the transmission from dogs to humans, we have to uh, treat uh, dogs for prevention of the zoonosis. So as the humans are unable to mark a strong immune response against these human species, uh, does this phenomena occur uh, similarly in the dogs? Haven't we tried to prepare some vaccine in dogs so that we can prevent the uh, problem at the root uh, so that the transmission doesn't occur from the dogs to the uh, humans. And the, the second question is that uh, uh, you have characterized the Enchalostoma selenigum in different regions. Uh, does that uh, genetic makeup is entirely similar or is there any difference in different regions of the world? And is there any difference that we have uh, I learned from 1913 that uh, in that in that time that is not the Enchylostoma selenicum, um, but the parasite that was emerged. Is there any difference? So the first so. question, thanks Abdul. The first question is, I guess, relating to vaccines. And it's yeah. important to, I guess, um, know that the vaccine that they're developing in humans for human hookworm control um, is one not to eliminate infection but to reduce morbidity so like i said before there is no absolute immunity to hookworm disease which means that they can keep the number of adult worms under control but not eliminate it completely and by keeping the numbers low you reduce the ill effects or, or uh, the uh, severity of the disease that it produces in humans so a very kind of different way of thinking uh, in, in parasitology compared to other infectious diseases. We could do the same in, in dogs and they were, and they, you know, they were hum, uh, dog hookworm uh, vaccines produced just with uh, irradiated larvae, which you know, is, is a proof of concept principle that will work. But again, it's not absolute. It's, um, it's, it keeps numbers under control. So yes, I think that in future, human, I mean, vaccines targeting these uh, hookworms all zoonotic hookworms and dogs could well be uh, part of the solution. Uh, but at least in the immediate term where the World Health Organization and ministries of health are going crazy deworming humans on a mass scale, um, they really need to consider what's gonna happen once they stop deworming those humans and get rid of those human parasites from uh, the, the environment with, you know, without having paid attention to the dogs, they might be in trouble once they stop deworming people. And we're seeing this already because their deworming targets children and we don't find much selenicum in children. Majority of it is in the adult population that aren't being dewormed. Yes, you're right. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Um, now, Lee Skerritt, did you have a question? Uh, no, you don't. You're saying you have to go to another meeting. Um, indeed, Not I really. have to. <laughs> Uh, I, will, I have to go to another meeting in a moment, but Richard Eckard will take over um, the question and answers. Um, but let's just move on to the next one. I'll do one more and then I have to go. Uh, Francesca Gaspar, um, can we? Uh, can you yes. ask your question, please? Yeah. Yes, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, yep, thank you so much yeah. for the webinar. Um, I'm originally from the Philippines, and so a majority of dogs in the Philippines are stray dogs. They're not like people's dogs. So I was curious as to what your suggestions would be. If the World Health Organization asked you tomorrow, what do you suggest we do about stray dogs in those areas? Yeah. What would your prime suggestion be? Well, it would be, um, so hi, Francesca. And yes, I know Solanicum is rampant in the Philippines, not only in dogs, but yes, in humans. And the data just needs to be published. Um, 
basically what I would suggest is that, of course, in, in, in urban municipalities, they should do what they're doing around Asia, um, is of course, with the um, animal birth control rabies programs, they really need to incorporate some form of deworming. Um, so sure, as a one-off, they could give moxidectin or ivermectin off-label, um, but in the longer term, they need to really bring uh, communities together uh, because most of these are so-called stray dogs do belong to someone. They do belong to a household that feeds them. And if the government could at least uh, distribute, um, you know, uh, off-label, very cheap uh, dewormers, even on a piece of bread that could then uh, accompany the evening leftovers, uh, be provided to the dog, that would really, I think, um, uh, how do you say, impact on... on um, reducing environmental transmission with uh, with these zoonotic hookworms and roundworms like Toxicara as well. Thank you very much. No worries. Um, Rebecca, I will have to go. Um, I just wanted to say fantastic um, lecture. Thank you so much for that and uh, aimed at just the right level. Um, I will go hand over to Richard Eckog because there are still some more questions. Um, Richard, Thanks, over John. to you. Great. Um, thank you, John. Um, uh, I, I, Beck, the next question comes from JP. Uh, JP, do you want to ask your question? Yes, I, I was just wondering about uh, the emergence of drug resistance in the swarm populations, both in the dog and in humans. I mean, it's quite common in parasites that if you start treating large numbers of humans or dogs for that matter, uh, or other animals for those parasites, then drug mm -hmm. resistance invariably comes up. What's the situation with, uh, with those ones? I don't believe that there has been, we were talking, Vito and I were talking the other day, comparing the data we've got right now for the um, single dose albendazole therapy in the hookworms for communities in Cambodia. If you look at the original data from the 1950s, the efficacy of single dose benzimidazoles, at least for the hookworms, was not very high in the first place. Benzimidazoles, when provided to humans and monogastric animals like dogs, um, need to be given for three days in a row. What the WHO are doing is, due to cost and logistical reasons, they give it as a single dose treatment. And so obviously you're not gonna get 100% efficacy. So when I see reports of low efficacy, growing resistance of BZs in you know, human Ascaris and Trichuris and hookworm infections, you can't say that unless you compare that current data to the original data. And in many cases, they ain't no original data. So if you ask me, it isn't a problem. And the reason it isn't is because one, efficacy is low, but two, when I say mass drug administration, what they're doing is they're treating a very small cohort. They're treating school children. So children up to the age of 14, 15 years old now. Um, and these groups are targeted because they have the highest burdens and highest, I guess, morbidity associated with these worms. So there is sufficient refugia from the rest of the population, okay, to, I think, continue, um, you know, susceptible strains or isolates of these worms in, 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 I guess, circulation. When it will become, I guess, scary is if they do go into community-based deworming um, with suboptimal doses of BZs, uh, we might be seeing something different. I think we might see a different story develop there. But yeah, these, you know, I mean, the SNPs, the BZ SNPs are present in, in the human helmet. So there's no reason why they shouldn't develop. But at the moment, I don't feel it's a major issue, but it may become in time, may become in time when community rather than school-based deworming, um, if that's implemented, it might. Thank you. Uh, Jemima, there's a question you wanted to ask. Uh, if you unmute yourself, you can ask. Hi, thanks, Beck, for such a brilliant talk. I was interested in your thoughts on the relationship between helminth infections and autoimmune disorders in humans, and if there are any potential benefits of low-level controlled helminth infections as a treatment for autoimmune conditions? Definitely. Um, yes. Again, I'm, one, I'm a believer that the human helminth, at least um, having been personally infected myself, 
<laughs> um, damn it, there's no one to laugh back at me. Um, it's they're not that detrimental in small burdens, right? So these, as I said, these are, are, are worms and antigens that we've, I guess, developed with as a host species over thousands of years. And, and you know, to all of a sudden remove it completely from our system is about to, will un, inevitably, I think, pr produce some ill effect. And so um, there are groups, for example, Alex Lucas um, and company up in Cairns in um, JCU that uh, do infect humans with uh, very small doses of Mikado Americanus. And they have shown um, that these infections improve clinical signs associated with uh, irritable bowel, sorry, inflammatory bowel disease, so IBD in humans. So uh, yes, I do personally feel that a few Nicada Americanus probably won't do harm. It may even do more good than harm. Um, similarly, other groups are doing this with Trichurosuis in Europe as well, the, the trying to put um, pig uh, Trichurus in, in humans and seeing if that reduces clinical signs of things like Crohn's disease and um, it is working. So again, maybe deworming on a mass scale might be a bit too much. Um, and maybe we should keep some uh, level of, of uh, what we're used to in our guts so that we don't all get infected with something that we're not used to, like Ancelostoma solanicum, for example. Uh, Beck, you, you mentioned um, deworming in the dog population, um, but then I saw there was a little point you made about um, wild animals continuing the infection. Um, is there a problem if, if there's a... I I don't know how many wild animals there are left. I think the, the wild animals was uh, the, the jackals. Um, that was made by, in 1913 by um, Clayton Lane, when jackals used to be quite common in, in rural communities in India. Um, I haven't seen a jackal. <laughs> I was thinking more Africa, where, where they are, actually are quite prevalent and they yeah. hang around villages for scraps. Yeah, yeah, they could, definitely. They could. So you could have a targeted deworming program for the dogs um, yeah. once off and then the jackals do the reinfection. So that's yeah, but I'm assuming that hopefully, I guess, the, the wild dogs or canids would be defecating at sites that are not close to where the humans roam, that it would be, you know, in the jungle somewhere, whereas it's the wild, I mean, the local or domestic dogs are probably the ones uh, contributing most of the soil contamination in areas where the kids and other humans roam. The fields are a very different aspect. I mean, most of these guys, when they go to defecate or if they're working in rice fields, that's where they get infected the most. Yeah. Um, and so, because none of them can wear their shoes in the rice fields, it's too sticky, right? Um, so that's the main source of infection. And these dogs do follow their owners every morning to the rice fields and follow them back every evening. So I think, again, it's the domestic dog that really needs to be targeted. Okay. Here's one last question from Ganzafar. Um, do you want to ask your question? Hi, thanks for picking up our wonderful talk. Uh, this is just a quick question. Is there any difference in age-based prevalence in case of human infection? Like, youngs are more prone than the adults? Yeah, so um, what we found is no, there is, there is, right? But even though um, you would think that kids would be the most uh, as I said, exposed to infection, given they're the ones that are playing with the dogs and are running around bare feet, what we seem to find in the population is that it's the early adults, so it's the 16 to 25-year-olds, uh, or even up to 30-year-olds, that are uh, that infection is most prevalent and also highest intensity. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the kids are not getting infected, but like I said before, it's the kids that are getting dewormed. So as part of the Ministry of Health's programs, they are targeting school kids. So it's likely that they are infected, but the six monthly deworming is probably getting rid of those infections quite quickly. Whereas the adults who've missed out, so as soon as they get out of school, they are the ones where I think infection is most common because they're not the ones being targeted for deworming and plus they're going out into the fields to start working in the farms and their exposure is probably getting uh, quite high risk through through that uh, avenue. Okay, thanks. 
Um, we, we'll go with uh, one last question and then uh, have to wrap it up. But Lily has got a question for you. Uh, are you able to speak that, um, Lily? Oh, hi. Um, hi, Lily. Hi, thanks for your talk, Rebecca. Um, my question is about the need for accurate diagnostics. Um, how feasible is PCR for long-term surveillance of soil transmitted elements in low resource countries? Thank Very you. good question, Lily. And that's something we're looking into right now. I guess there's a lot of studies going, around, going on around the world to try and see how we can make PCR more, I guess, cost-effective because um, surprisingly enough, um, taking whole teams of, of um, so currently diagnostics basically is microscopy based. And if you take a whole team of 20 technicians into the field, by the time you pay for petrol and their accommodation, um, and then, uh, you know, for two weeks to do, say, a survey of um, five villages, right? Um, and get results that may not mean much as far as at least the, the species of, of soil transmitter helminths or the species of hookworms. It's sometimes worth sort of taking a step back and saying, well, what if we went into those same communities with three people spent three days collecting the feces, putting it in some ethanol, coming back to a centralized laboratory, and then using the same staff, retraining them to do qPCR. Um, the qPCRs on average, the most expensive component is the extraction, the DNA extraction, um, but there are, are ways to overcome those um, expenses. So, for example, by pooling samples. So, if you want to pool samples, given how sensitive uh, QPCR is, um, that might be a way to overcome some of the costs. Labor, it, it's much quicker to do, so labor becomes cheaper. Um, and you might have more accurate, um, high throughput results uh, within the same time period. Um, perhaps a little more expensive, but as I said, there are ways and means now of, of and I think there are research studies comparing those, um, you know, traditional versus uh, through high throughput molecular based diagnostics to see which one would in fact be more cost effective, um, especially in the surveillance part of it, where, light, where there are light infections and where they've stopped MDA and they're gonna monitor infection. I think it's important to use highly sensitive tools like qPCR. Great. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Fascinating. Um, and uh, there were quite a few comments in the chat that there were others laughing with you. So uh, even oh, good. <laughs> um, particularly those of us like me and probably yourself who were raised in developing countries and, uh, you know, did a lot of uh, work with dogs and walking barefoot and all that. We've all been infected. Um, so uh, thanks for the presentation and really engaging in the uh, um, thanks everyone else for joining us and uh, join us for the next one. Thank you. No worries. Thank you guys.